Good morning, everybody. We're going to be doing some trainings today. Uh, these trainings are meant to be a uh, complement to what other agents have uh, learned at the association trainings for the MLS. Uh, in no way, shape, or form are we saying for you not to take those trainings. They are important for you to take. There is Matrix 101, Matrix 201, and Matrix 301. It is essential for us as realtors that we know the product. But the idea here is we're going to do some trainings that help out and complement what you will learn at the association. Uh, today's very first training is going to be on how to input a listing. So we're going to start a, by doing some research. Basically when you're inputting a listing, we've assumed that you've already gotten your listing agreement, you've got it executed and you've uploaded it to LondonFoster.net. So what we're going to do now is really actually put input the listing into the multiple listing service. So we're going to start doing some research on that. So the very first thing we're going to do today is we're going to get onto our MLS service. As most of you know, you need to visit www.miamire.com. This is the website for our association. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do that. And we're going to log on. We're going to hit the dashboard. And when we did to hit the dashboard, it's going to ask us for our username and password. You guys should know this and keep this handy. I just didn't put it wrong. I'll do it again. Okay, and then once you do that, it's going to take you to the dashboard. At the dashboard, you will see some of the software that is provided for us by the association. The one that we're going to be looking at is Matrix. So we're going to go ahead and hit Matrix. And while we're in Matrix, there's a couple of ways that you can look up a listing. Um, I'm going to work on a listing that I'm actually going to be putting into the system probably in a couple of weeks. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do it for you because that way it won't be already in the system and it'll be like a brand new way that we're doing it. So the very first thing that I would recommend is that you look it up on the MLS for any previous uh, listings that have been posted for that address. It's a very good uh, trick on regard, in regards to education. You get to find out a little bit about how much it was listed for, what the person you know, wrote in the description. You get a kind of an idea of what they did that maybe they did wrong. Um, but it's also a great idea because some, half of the work is done for you. Okay? I'm not saying to trust it 100%, but at least half of the, done, the, the work is done for you. You can always verify the work. The second thing is to look at the tax roll. It is important to look up the tax roll. Uh, the tax roll is going to have vital information about the property. It's going to tell you a little bit about um, the square footage. So that's something you might want to verify. The tax roll is also going to tell you whether or not it's homestead, something that you need to advise your clients you know, when you're showing it, whether or not they're getting that homestead exemption. Um, but we'll go into that. And then there's also IMAP. So it's also important to look it up on IMAP. IMAP will have some of the history of the property, how much it's sold for, how much it's sold for in the past. It's always a good way of re-verifying that information. So we're gonna start with a property that I have, which is 10275 Collins Avenue, number 304. So what would be the easiest way to look it up? The easiest way to look it up would be to look up past listing agreements that have been put into the MLS. And I'm going to go ahead and start by doing a search. I know that this is a single family home or condo, so I'm gonna go under single family or condo. I'm not gonna be looking for active listings because it's not in the MLS right now. So what I'm gonna look for are things that are closed or canceled. You'll notice here that when you put in closed or canceled, it gives you one, uh, zero to 180 days. Basically, the MLS is automatically gonna try to reduce the amount of searches that you make because they don't want you to come up with 20,000 um, 20, items because they won't be able to display it. So what they try to do is automatically give you six months. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go in and you're gonna take that out. Okay, you're gonna open it to, to all the, the history. And I believe at this point, the MLS is in nine years. It has nine years of, of history uh, that they record. So we're gonna go ahead and put in the building number. The building number, like I said, is 10275. We're gonna skip the direction of the street because there is no direction. And I'm gonna write the word Collins. Okay, you'll see that I already got 507, um, that it pulled up 507 listings that have closed or have been canceled in that particular building in the last nine years. So I'm gonna try to reduce it a little bit further, which is I'm gonna write the, the apartment number, and when I do that, it reduces down to two. So 
So that's a great way of looking this listing up. We're gonna go look at results. We're gonna click here under results. And it's gonna show us the listing however we have it in. Um, there are several ways that you can look at it. I like looking at one that I've created for myself, which is the copy. Um, there is also a single line, a single page, a multi-row agent single line. Um, I like looking at the one that I've created because it has some criteria, but here are two. There's one that says that it has closed, I'm, I'm sorry, that it's been canceled, and there's another one that says that it has closed. So, more than likely, I'm gonna look at the one that's closed, right? Because if it's closed, it worked well. If you look at this, it's gonna give us some really interesting information. It's going to give us uh, the, pack, the fact that it was listed at 229, uh, the fact that it was sold at 215. It's gonna tell us who bought it, who sold it. Um, all this is fascinating information. It gives us the, the realtor remarks. It's going to give us basically every single piece of information we need. So what I'm gonna do now is that I'm going to print it. I'm gonna keep this for myself in order for me to print it and have it alongside. So as I go filling it out, I'm gonna have a reference where I can go back and say, okay, how can I do this maybe a little bit better? So I'm gonna go ahead and print this page and then I'm gonna go back to the results. Interesting information. We need to know the folio number. So here it's telling me that the folio number is one two 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 six zero oh, four three zero oh, five three zero. Okay. I'm also going to look up the MLS number in case I need to get this screen again, which is A one nine eight zero oh, seven five seven. Okay, so that's super, super helpful information as we go in and plug it in. Now, if I hit on the folio number, if I click on that folio number, it's automatically gonna take me to IMAP. So I'm gonna show you really quick what's important on IMAP. So IMAP is gonna give me a couple of pieces of information that are gonna be very, very important. One of it is going to be who the current owner is. So I've got here that it's Vero 10, so let's write this down, Vero 10 Investments. Now why would that be imp important? Well obviously you've already, done a, you've already done a listing agreement, but this is again a second step to verify that the person that has signed the listing agreement, the person you're doing business with, actually is the owner and actually is the person that, you can, that, that can sign for a contract for this. Nothing worse than getting into a contract and then having that contract fall apart because guess what, they're in the middle of a divorce and the wife is not willing to sign. Um, you can look this up on sunbiz, S-U-N-B-I-Z dot com. Just look up that name and it'll tell you everybody who's on the a, association or anybody who's on that um, a, LLC. But more importantly, it'll tell you who's auth authorized to sign. Okay, so that's really great information that we have here. It's also gonna tell us something about the land it's gonna tell us the size of the, the block and plot number. It's gonna tell us the size. All of this information is essential. So what we're gonna do right now is we're going to print this page. Um, so now that you've looked at the IMAP, you're gonna notice that it has some information there. I'm gonna print this page to use it again as a reference, but um, great little reference here. And it's gonna ask you for this when you're inputting the listing. It'll tell you who the, who the PK to eighth grade is. It'll tell you who the sixth to eighth grade or the middle school is. And then it'll tell you also who the high school is. So these are pieces of information that you're gonna need later on in the, in when you're inputting the listing. So it's great to have it printed out and that way it makes your life a little bit easier. If you click on the folio number within IMAP, it'll take you to the tax record. Again, a great piece of information. Um, I like printing these all out to have them next to me when I'm putting in the listing. But also, it's a great piece of information and I recommend that you print it as a PDF. Keep this in file with you for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, you need to prove where you got this information. Where did I get this information? Can the information change? Absolutely. The owner can go in afterwards and change the tax information. But if you have 
a printed copy or a PDF of what you put in and why I put it in, this is where I got it from, you're protecting yourself. It's always a good idea. I also like, and I think I did this in the last um, training, the one about contracts, I like keeping a PDF of the tax record of IMAP and of my MLS listing so that when I present an offer, it's always there presented. Um, if I've said that the, that the that it's paying 4%, then no agent can come back and say, oh no, I read that it's at six. No, nope, it's been here, This I saved it, it's there. Um, here in the office of property appraisers, it's going to have some other additional information. It'll tell you the living area, the adjusted living area. It'll tell you the year that it was built. Um, any assessments that it has on the building, anything like that that you also want to have as proof. Okay, so now we're going to go in and we're actually going to add a new listing. The way that you would do that is you would go in Matrix under Add Edit. There are several ways of doing it. You can edit an existing listing. You can quickly modify an existing listing. Or you can go up here where it says Add New. When you go to add new, it's going to tell you to select a form, to select a way of putting, um, to select the type of property that it is. So here's where you will let them know whether or not it's a single family home, a condo, residential rental, land and boat, residential income, land, commercial, business, agriculture, industrial, improved commercial, industrial, or a business opportunity. Obviously, as I said, this is an apartment, so we're going to go to the very second option, which is condo, co-op, and townhouse. When we go into condo, co-op, and townhouse, it's going to ask us to pick a county. We're going to pick Dade County, and here you can obviously look it up through the street address and the thing, but since we already have the property ID or the folio number, it makes no sense to do that. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to type in the number, which is 12. Two 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 six zero oh, four three zero oh, five three zero. Okay, so I'm gonna tell the database to pull from the tax records that folio number, so that all that information that is on the tax record is automatically pulled into the listing. And I'm gonna say search, and based on my ID it'll give me a property. You'll notice a couple of things that are interesting. The tax ID is divided into little sections. We'll go over that in a second why. Um, it says 12 22 26 um, It also tells you the owner's name. The owner's name again is just as I had written it, Vero 10 Investments LLC. It'll tell you the house number, the street address, the apartment number, the county, and the zip code. Why is it doing this? This is a measure for you to verify that it is the correct property. Okay, so you're going to click on the word fill. And what it's doing, it's exactly that. It's filling out all, all your information automatically into your input from the tax record so that you don't have to go back to this sheet that I printed and write one by one by one by one. Okay, so it's going to ask you for a couple of things that are really interesting. The first one you're gonna notice that, we, that it doesn't pull is that it's gonna ask you for the area. The area is part of your um, part of your folio number, and for some reason it doesn't pull it in. I don't know if they do it as a security measure, just so that everything's not automated, so that you actually have to go in and know a little bit what you're doing. This is when the previous listing comes in handy. Why? Well, because here this person had already put it in, and so I'm going to look for the number 22. It's gonna, you see that if my street address is there, my compass point is not necessary, the street name, the apartment number, the zip code, the folio number, the state, the legal description, the unit floor location. It is safe to assume that if this is on unit 304, that it's gonna be on the third floor, so we write that in. Total floors in the building, it says that it is 15. So again, this is something that I got from the previous listing. Sometimes I print two or three, especially when it's like a sketchy property or something that I'm not really too sure about. This is a nice condo, so this is something that I'm assuming that the people actually know what they're doing. But when it's like a duplex or something a little bit sketchy, I'll, I'll double check. Um, it's going to ask you what the building number is. 
The building number, there is no actual building number. It's just one single building. This is more like in a complex where you're going to have building number 200, building 400, building 600. Just another way of subdividing it or, or identifying it. Um, since we don't know how many units are in the building, this is a great example of how these things come up. We have a couple options. We can either A, look up uh, another listing and try to see if they maybe included it. That's a, that's a little shortcut for us to do. The other great way is to go into that actual listing, which I wrote down, it's A198075757. And I'm gonna look at this one and I'm gonna open up the floor plans. If you look at this little icon that has three little rectangles in the listing, that is the floor plan icon. It'll show us the floor plan for the unit. Great way of, of um, downloading that, uh, that floor plan. It's a great way of downloading a floor plan. You can also include that within the pictures of your listing. It's a great way to have it. Um, also, have it available at your property. A lot of a lot of clients are going to want the floor plan in order to look at it. Um, so, if you look here under mycondosplans.com, it has the listing number. It'll tell you that the, the size of it, everything else. But if you look later on, it's going to tell you that the number of units. is 451. Okay, so since we went ahead and we looked it up on mycondoplans.com, we found out that the units are 451 in the building. So we're gonna go ahead and type that in in this section. We're gonna continue down and you're gonna see that the municipal code, the township, the section, the division, the parcel has already been filled out for you. It's going to tell you the, the name of Harbor House, which is the name of the building. Um, within the information that we pulled up on a IMAP, okay, it tells us what is the elementary school, the junior high school, and the a high school. So the very first one is called Ruth K. The second one is called Nautilus. And the third one is called Miami Beach Senior High. Okay, so let's go back into the listing. And we're going to use the drop down menu to find Ruth K. Hmm, it's a little tricky. Let me see if there's anywhere else where it could be. Okay, we're gonna leave that one blank. We're gonna go to middle school. I'll come back to it. The middle school is Nautilus. This one I know that it will be there. So you go under the letter N, you'll see right there where it's Nautilus. I hit Murray by mistake, sorry. There you go, Nautilus. And then it's gonna ask you for the senior high school, which is Miami Beach Senior High. Miami Beach Senior High. Development name, if there is a development name, you'd wanna add it there. In this one, there is not. If there is a model name, you'd wanna add it there. Um, it would be under the condo plans. It would tell you what the model name was. Um, in this one, there is no model name, obviously, because uh, these units are all part of one single condo, and it was not a pre-construction. It was probably a conversion, so it won't be there. Um, it will add you for a neighborhood, so you could say this is Bell Harbor. Okay. It's also gonna ask you for a geographical area and a units in the complex. As we said, it is not really a complex, but if you wanna re-add that in, um, you can go ahead and put that in. It's 451 units. And then the geographical area, you would have to look up a, where it says something like Bell Harbor,
Okay, if it doesn't, not necessarily to add it in. What you want to do now is since we finished this page, we're going to validate it. When you validate it, basically it's going to mention these fields are required, these are not. So when you go back up, if you validated and something was missing that they find essential, it'll let you know. Next, you can go on to the general information. The general information, it has a little bit more to do with the actual uh, offer that you're making. It's gonna ask you whether or not it is a, a short sale, if there's an addendum, if you need lender approval, if it's an REO, if there is a range, if there is a low list price, and this is done a lot in properties where you don't even, where the listing agent doesn't even want offers that are not in between a certain range. My recommendation is give a list price, try to get offers. The offers are awesome for two reasons. One, it might educate your uh, sales client, it might educate uh, the owner on what the, the, the real reality of the property is, but it's also a way of opening up the lines of communication. On this listing, we're going to list it at $330,000. Okay, it's going to ask you for the style. The style has more to do with the building, so it's going to tell you whether it's a condo, one to three floors, a condo, five floors or more, if it's a condo or a, a condo hotel, a co-op, which is one to four stories, uh, five stories or more, a townhouse, a townhouse condo, a villa. Obviously, in this case, it is a condo, and it has 15 floors, so it's going to be a, a C42. Okay, uh, the information on the total square footage, footage comes in. It's going to ask you for the type. This one is a condo. If it's a con, if it's a documentum or a hotel or a townhouse, you want to make sure you list that. What the front exposure is, okay? This is um, having more to do with where a, the front of the unit is facing. Um, not necessarily uh, applicable in a condo because it doesn't really matter where the door is facing because it's internal. Um, but if you want to add that, you can add that. The building area agent, building area source, auction, auction type, if it's available for lease. And if it is available for lease, you want to make sure that you cross-reference the a MLS number. So the, the person that is looking at it for sale says, oh, okay, let me show this to my client because this apartment is also for lease and maybe it's for an investment or maybe we can do a deal where they lease it and then they rent to own. Is the unit detached? This is very common um, in a townhouses where the townhouse actually does not share a wall. In this instance, it is a moot point, but I'm gonna go ahead and include it. Does it have a balcony? It does, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna include that. It asks to ask you when the year was built. This was pulled in from the tax information. It is also available on the condo uh, floor plan. It's going to ask you whether this was a condo conversion, a new construction, a resale under construction. This was a condo conversion. It's going to ask you if it's waterfront. You're going to say yes. HOPA. For those of you that do not know what HOPA is, HOPA is an, uh, an act to protect older persons. So it is the Housing for Older Persons Act. This is a special um, law and protection, not only on, on the, the occupant rights, but also it has a tax exemption. So there are a certain amount of rules. This is for people that want to live um, with people of, of likewise age without being discriminatory towards people that have children. So if it is a HOPA property, you need to disclose that. Why? Well, because if you have a young couple at 23 years old buying an apartment, they won't qualify to live in that building. Um, in order for HOPA to, to happen, there has to be at least one person living there that is of senior age, uh, 55 or older. So you don't want to make sure you want to make sure that you disclose this as soon as possible. You don't want to be presenting offers and getting into contract and last minute. Oh, by the way, this is a HOPA. So since your couple is only 23 years old, they can't live there. So just make sure that you verify that this is not a HOPA building. Uh, in this instance, it is not. It's going to ask you how many garage spaces you have. Um, in this particular unit, there are two garage spaces. It's going to ask you whether they are attached or detached. Um, attached or detached basically means are they in the building or are they outside of the building? 
uh, again, this is a big condo building, so it's obvious that it's in the garage. Um, but in some smaller condo buildings, it is common that it'll be outside in the front yard or it'll be in the backyard of a small building, especially here in Miami Beach. So you want to make sure that you, you know, uh, disclose that. Are there any carport spaces? In this uh, instance, it is not. It's going to ask you whether it is furnished or unfurnished. In this unit, it is being sold unfurnished. Um, heed a bit of warning. When you are selling something that is furnished, to make sure you have an inventory list of everything that is inside the unit that will be staying and another inventory list of everything that will be going. Um, you don't want to be faced with uh, uh, last minute, oh, but that beautiful lamp that I saw in the, in the living room, I thought it was part of the, of the apartment and the person's like, absolutely not. It's a very expensive lamp or an heirloom. So you want to make sure that you disclose all that. Uh, but more importantly, you want to know also that when you're doing a sale, the furniture can never be included as part of the sale. It has to be a separate contract, which an attorney has to do. We sell real estate. We do not sell soft items like lamps, sheets, towels, that sort of thing. We do not sell that. So it has to be a separate um, a portion of the contract, like an addendum that has to be written up by an attorney. The reason why is because when you're doing a sale, you want to make sure that the value of the property isn't over increased, especially in a loan situation, by the furniture. If it is, that has to be disclosed and it has to be considered separate because you can't get loan on furniture. You can't add value to a property based on furniture. Um, if there's an additional furniture, uh, you wanna make sure you write that out. If there's any dock spaces, if you know the park space number, I don't know if this person included it, no. But this is something interesting for me to ask the owner. What is the parking space number? Why is this important? Well, it, it will come up. It'll come up in the showing. You should know it. But more importantly, if you already have it, you can look it up while you're showing it or the person that is coming to bring a client, the realtor is coming to bring a client, will know the parking space number. It happens a lot. People want to know where they're parking, especially if they have a nice car, or especially if they have a, a large car, they wanna see that the car fits in that space. So just you should have that information. Uh, you wanna know what the minimum terms of the lease are. Uh, every, every building is going to be different. Um, it says here that you are able to rent twice a year for 180 days. So it's gonna say the amount of, the amount of time that you can do a lease, the minimum is 180. And the times a year, it says two. Governing bodies, this is going to have a condo board. You'll see that it has several different other options, like a builder control. That means that when the builder's uh, developing the, the unit, they first have a, like a, like a pre-condo board. You have a co-op board. A homeowner's association is very common in, um, a, in communities, in suburban communities. And then when there's no governing body, it's usually a small building and it's just simply, you know, everybody pays a little piece of it and it's, there's something there. In this instance, there is a condominium. It's going to ask you what the main uh, living area is. The main living area is um, either at the entry level, it is on the main living floor or upstairs. Most of them are going to be that when you first walk in, you're in the living room. But sometimes it's different, so you want to disclose that. It's going to ask you for the unit design. In the unit design, you can put in whatever uh, pertains to it. In this one, we're going to say that it's east of US 1. It is a high rise and it does have a lobby. Parking description, we're going to say two or more. and that there is valet parking. So you're gonna go all the way to the bottom and click on valet parking. As you see, I'm actually comparing it to what this person wrote, and this person actually wrote it incorrectly. It has two spaces and she wrote it had one. So I'm gonna make sure that I correct that on mine. This is why it's important to have a reference of what someone else did. Parking restrictions, okay. Uh, she wrote that there are none. I'm going to double check that. The reason why I'm going to check that is because in most condo buildings, they do not allow RVs, they do not allow trucks and trailers, and they do not allow um, a boats. So you want to make sure that that is correct. I'm going to go ahead and verify that. 
In the meantime, I'm going to leave it blank, but I'll come back to it. Waterfront description, it is oceanfront. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and add that. Okay, then it's going to ask for boat service. If there is a boat service, I know in this building there is not. There is no dock or anything for you to get boat service. Then it's finally going to take you over to features. If you go down to features, if you go down to features, it's going to ask you features that have to do with the unit's view. In this unit, we have direct ocean view. So we're going to click on direct ocean view. If you have water access, this is usually when you have a dock. Again, we don't have a dock in this one, so it's not the case. It's going to ask us what kind of floors we have. They have tiled floors in this unit. Construction type, we're going to look through all of these. This one is con concrete block construction or something called CBC. So you want to make sure you click on that. Security information, there is a doorman. The elevator is secure. There is the garage is secured. Let's see what they wrote here. They wrote here lobby secured. Okay, we go, we'll, we'll write that one in also. Well, I already picked three, so we're good. So again, now that we finished page two, I'm going to validate. And if there is anything that needs to be addressed, it will let me know. As you can see, the very first one, I did not write that it was a, not a short sale. So I actually have to go in and write no. And then I have there under REO, I also have to write no. And then I can go back and validate. So now that I validated, you will see that there are no red areas. There is one right here that's asking me whether or not there is a deeded beach access. There it is. What did they write here? Deeded beach access. Perfect. So I, I forgot to write that in. I wrote it in. Now I'll go back and validate a third time. Okay. And everything should be fine. Let me double check. Yep. Everything is fine. So if you look under location information, the first one that we did, there is one here. Remember, we, I forgot to write in the area 22 and the complex name. Okay, validated, so it's done. I'm going to skip remarks. We'll get back to that at the end, but now I'm gonna go ahead and go into rooms. When I go into rooms, it is going to pull up how many bedrooms there are, how many bathrooms there are. Do you wanna do that again? When I go into rooms, it's going to, let me do this. When I go into rooms, it's going to ask me, it's going to uh, ask me how many bedrooms there are, how many bathrooms there are, and how many half bathrooms there are. Obviously, I pulled this up from the tax record, so it is done. It's going to ask me for a bedroom description. It gives you a max of four options. Let's see what this person wrote. Okay, they wrote entry level and studio. Okay, perfect. So I'll write entry level. Studio. It's going to ask me a master bath description, if there's a bidet, if there's a combination tub and shower, if there are dual sinks, if it's a shower only, a separate tub and shower, a whirlpool or spa. Again, you have five options. I, I put in combination tub and shower. It's going to ask me about the additional rooms, if there's a den, a family room, a Florida room, anything that you can add that fits that description. It is a great idea for you to do it here. Okay, there is nothing that's fitting into these. And then ADA compliant has to do with, um, for the handicap. So if there's any kind of handicap bars, handicap access, yeah, the kitchen has been modified, you wanna let people know that. Um, and then here, it has a very cool little section down here, which if you wanted to take advantage of the fact that you have the floor plan, you can do this. For instance, I know that the studio, the main room of the studio is 16.9 by 17.4. Okay, I know that the kitchen is 10.8 by 
10 6. And I also know that the balcony is 8 by 5 7. So if you really wanted to do this right and you wanted to take advantage and give as much information, not only to the agent, to the realtor, but sometimes to the actual end user, you're able to add these. You'll see here under room type, it'll ask you what you're trying to do. And it could, let, me, let me put in the balcony. I'm gonna write the balcony dimensions are eight feet by five feet seven inches. I want to make sure to reiterate this to people because I see this mistake a lot. A feet is one hyphen note, inches are two. So then you go ahead and you click on more and then you can pick the next room. The next room we're going to do is the kitchen. Kitchen, again, is 10 feet space eight inches by 10 feet space six inches and then I'll go ahead and do one more which is the actual main room great room is what they call it the main room which is 16 hyphen space 9 inches by 17 hyphen 4 inches Okay, once I've done that, again, I'm going to validate that all this information is correct. It'll take me up and you'll see that there is no exclamation mark under rooms, which means that that is complete and I can go back in. This is going to be the additional information. It's going to ask you specific information about the building. So again, I have used somebody else's listing as a reference. You want to double check your work. You always want to talk to the management office. If you want to print out two or three people's, that's probably a very good bet. Um, but if we're going to ask you, is it cable, I'm sorry, is our pets allowed? And you're going to say yes. It's going to ask you if there's any restrictions um, on, on pets. And it's going to say yes, the restriction is anything larger than 20 pounds. It's going to ask you if there's a ceiling fan. There is not. It's going to ask you if cable is available. You're going to write yes. It's going to ask you the interior features. First floor entry. There is a Roman tub. And walk in closets. Okay, it's going to ask you about the equipment. So you can click all the ones that pertain to it. If there's a dishwasher, disposal, if there's a dryer, if there's a washer. Electric water heater. There's an elevator, a fire alarm, a fuse box, any of this information that you need to add in, you can go ahead and add it in. If you have window treatments, this is something else you want to go ahead and add in. And we're going to keep on going. We're going to go down to exterior features, high impact windows, a maintenance included. It cleans the building exterior, all amenities. Cable TV is included in your maintenance. The common areas, elevator, hot water, landscaping, a manager, outside maintenance, Pest control, recreational facilities, security, sewer, trash removal, water. 
As you see, this is extensive. Why is it important for you to add this? It's important because this is the way you avoid a realtor calling you and going, hey, is cable included? So be mindful of it. Verify this information with the management office. Verify it with your owner. Um, and then verify it with the management office. But you want to make sure that you present the best picture possible for the realtor so that the realtor can actually present this to their client. Um, this is going to be the difference between you getting people calling you, and some people will call you anyways, but this will be people calling you going, oh, is water included? You know, it's obvious that it is, but this, this is a way, if, you're, if you leave it blank, you're going to get calls on, on very silly, especially from newbie agents that don't know how to read this. So you want to make sure you put it as soon as possible. Within amenities, it's going to tell you what, what the amenities are. There is a bar, there is a billiard room, there is a barbecue area, community center, elevator, exercise room, exterior lighting, Pool, sauna, spa, hot tub, and trash chute. Okay, we're going to continue on to the restrictions. Every building is going to have restrictions. Right here, we're not going to allow a daily rentals. You can write here, OK to lease. And like I said, more than likely, this one does not allow trucks or RVs, but I'm going to go ahead and verify that. So since we've already created our listing, the next step we're going to do is add some photographs. This is a very important section and a very important part of your listing. It's going to separate you uh, from the average listing. I recommend that you go to LondonFoster.net and you visit under the vendors column. We actually have all of our vendors listed there. Uh, within our vendors, our photography vendor is I Use Photography, which is www.iusephotography. I highly recommend that you use a professional photographer and that you get as many pictures as you possibly can for the, for the listing. A couple great tricks when you're doing um, photographs I highly recommend the use of a professional photographer because now these search engine uh, optimization software, especially for Zillow and Trulia and um, a Realtor have become very sophisticated. And if they don't have HDR, which is high, uh, H, I think, high resolution, high definition resolution uh, photographs, they will actually penalize you and put you on the bottom. So the days of taking pictures with your phone are gone. It'll actually hurt your listing with some within some of these search engines. So it is important for you to use professional photographs. Uh, depending on the photograph, depending on the property, you're gonna you know want to have different kinds of pictures. If it's a, a home with a large yard, why not add in a pool and say on the bottom, this is a rendering of what a pool could look like at this house. Uh, anything that we can do to try to present ourselves in the best light. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start from scratch so that we actually have, um, we're all on the same page. Forgive me one second. I'm going to try to delete everything and I'm going to start from scratch here. I want to make sure that everybody understands how to get back into the MLS. So we're going to start by opening up the internet and we're going to log back into MiamiRE.com. And again, this is once I've already input the listing, we're going to go into the gateway and we're going to pick matrix. Okay, so we're going to go into add edit and we're going to look for the listing that I have that is incomplete. 
So if you look here in the very last one, it has an I on it. That means that it has not been finalized, it has not been made active, it hasn't gone live. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not gonna let it go live until I have all my pictures with me. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna open that up and I'm gonna look through the, the uh, menu of options that I have and it says that I can delete the incoming status listing, I can change it to active, I can you know, change the information. I can also manage photos and manage attachments. So I'm gonna go to manage photos. Uh, manage attachments is obviously what, what, it, what it sounds like. It's where you would go and put in, if you have the condo docs, if you have the condo application, if you have a floor plan, if you have any kind of a financial information on the building, if you have a lot and plot, information this is somewhere where you would want to do it why not offer this to the realtor that's going to be list that's going to be showing your listing so that they come prepared and they actually can do some of their due diligence it saves you a lot of time so here we're going to go into manage photos and here it's going to allow me to download some of my pictures so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and open up a new window and I'm going to log into iusephotography.com. At iusephotography.com, the one of the benefits is that they will save all your pictures for you. So I can actually go in. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to log in. So it's going to ask me for my email. Okay, and that's, this brings me over to my dashboard. In my dashboard, I'm able to see my previous orders. Okay, so if you look here, you'll be able to look at the ones that I've already ordered. Obviously, I haven't taken pictures on this one yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna look at this one that says 24 uh, HDR photos, including one twilight. So I'm gonna click on that one. And then I'm gonna go to my photo gallery. When I go to my photo gallery, it allows me to download all of my photos. So I'm going to download all of my photos. It reiterates that I want to download all of my photos. It's downloading. Okay, so once it's downloaded, I'm going to go ahead and open this folder. And if you see, I have an entire folder full of pic photographs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get that folder and I'm going to drag it onto my desktop. Okay, so once I've dragged and uh, dragged that all that download folder into my desktop, I can now go back into the MLS and we're gonna click on the browse, okay? So we're gonna go from the browse into that folder and we're going to highlight Control A, Command A on an, on an Apple or Control A on a, desk, on a PC and we're going to choose all of these photographs, okay? So now what's, what it's gonna do is it's gonna start downloading one by one, okay? So if you wanna start looking it'll show you how it starts downloading the first one it'll be the, the obviously it'll be the primary shot and then it'll start downloading as we go so let's just give that a few minutes and we'll get back to how we're gonna um, certify and verify these okay okay so they've already downloaded we've got 26 pictures in here i'm going to show you a couple of things you can do with the pictures the very first one is that you can put this little x over the picture and rearrange them. So you can bring this one to be the primary shot. Okay, this was a twilight picture that I took. So, since this is a twilight picture, I wanna make sure that I disclose it. So I'm gonna click on that and it's gonna bring up a large version of that picture. 
and then I'm going to be able to edit description. So I'm going to say this is a twilight photo edit of the view from the extensive balcony. So how I misspelled twilight? Well, let me know so I fixed it. Make sure you don't have any misspellings and then you can go back and save it. Is it a good idea to edit every single picture and make sure that you have a description? Why not? It adds text to your, to your listing. It actually could, will fortify the SEOs when it is in the, in the system. So it actually is, is a very good idea for you to do that. Remember how we spoke about the floor plan? This would be a great opportunity for you to go in here, browse, and upload a floor plan. If you have anything like renderings of the lobby, if you have, um, sometimes a management company will have that. Um, on this one, for, for instance, I took 24 pictures of the unit. I took nothing of the amenities. So do I want to go out and pay another $250 to get maybe photos of the amenities? Maybe not. But definitely I would keep those in the bottom of the list and have the, the top list or the, the main picture, the one that the, that the, that the other uh, software is going to be looking at, be the HDR photos. Uh, you can add as many pictures of you as you like up until 35. I recommend you um, add at least 21. A trick for people that pay for only 12 pictures, add them in twice. That way you have 24 pictures because some of these search engines, including Zillow, what they do is that if you have less than 21 pictures, they penalize you for it. So that's a, a, a great little trick to adding those in there. Okay, so now I'm going to certify and save these. Okay, and then those, those have been done there. Again, you can always go into Manage Attachments. It'll ask you what the description of the attachment is. Choose the file, and then you can put any of these. Addendums, amendments, applications, appraisals, as-is contract, the brochure, the budget summary, the condo bylaws, condo docs, counter offer uh, forms, disclosures, dues, financials, floor plans, homeowners association disclosure, lead-based paint disclosure, um, rules and regulations, seller's disclosure, very big, and obviously the survey. So guys, that's basically the second part of this training, which was adding on the pictures and the attachments for the listing.